ATPI, delivering what really matters. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Speed Freaks Chat Show with myself, Scott Nichols, all brought to you by our title sponsors, ATPI. Now, the verb one from Down Under is on uh, national leave right now, so we're taking full advantage of the rider replacement facility, and we've brought in Steve Brandon, a.k.a. the Talking Thumb, the Stat Man. Brando, which Speed Freak legend do we have joining us today? Um, only a four-time World Speedway champion who's ridden in more Grand Prix races than any other rider, scored more points, rode in 218 rounds, 177 of them consecutively. Yes, indeed, Mr. Greg Hancock. That's some stat, Brando. Oh, yeah. How do you feel about that, Greg? Well, you know, I mean, uh, I didn't know a lot of that stuff either, so it's leave it to Brando to, uh, you know, enlighten my day and get my my day my friday morning started this is fantastic i feel i feel like now i feel like i, I was somebody <laughs> <laughs> that's it that's some serious mileage you done there so i tell you how about we wind that mileage clock right back to zero and um where did it all start for you greg where did kind of this passion and love for speed and everything where and when did it all kick off for you well, I, I think, you know, you, you being a fellow rider yourself, you know, for us, it, it starts at a very young age. Fortunately, my dad um, introduced me to the sport when I was approximately six years old, somewhere around there. And uh, uh, my parents were split up at a very young age. And then um, dad moved down to uh, to Newport Beach, which was uh, really close to Costa Mesa Speedway. So he pretty much made uh, Friday nights were a regular thing for him. And um, you remember Josh Larson back in the day? Josh Larson's dad was also newly uh, divorced or separated from his wife at the time. So my dad and, and Josh's dad ended up meeting each other, living uh, in different apartments. Literally, Josh's dad was on the downstairs apartment. My dad was on the upstairs apartment on Balboa Island. And that's how they met. I think that's how they met anyway. And um, pretty much from there, that's where the Speedway thing started. Charlie, Josh's dad, got my dad going to Speedway with him. Uh, they hooked up with Bobby Schwartz because Charlie was a friend of Bobby's when he was like young, I, I want to say 16, 17 years old or something, just coming out of LA and Santa Barbara area and, um, started that thing, that kind of rapport grew right from that point. This story could be slightly off a little bit because I don't know all the details. I was a little dude back in the day and I'm sure those dudes were having fun. <laughs> um, I was going to say, know. I think <laughs> Boogaloo's told me some stories about that infamous house and none of those we can share on this show no that's right and there's a yeah there's a lot of things there that um you know i do have a hidden i do actually have a hidden talent we might have to talk about this and i ah. might have to i might have to reenact it it just came out right we'll save that one. yeah we'll save that one um anyway it was like that and um so my dad and charlie they they were doing friday nights on a regular deal my dad would pick us up from my mom's house on a Friday evening. We stayed with him every other weekend. Uh, he'd pick us up. We'd drive pretty much down to his house, drop off all our stuff, go straight to the Speedway. We had dinner at the Speedway track, which is perfect, right? A stadium yeah. steak, a.k.a. hot dog. Race food. And, uh, race food. And uh, we would watch Speedway on a Friday night and run around under the grandstands collecting beer cups and people's wallets and whatever else we could find <laughs> and, um, and watch Speedway in between. So um, getting autographs and kind of initiated the whole process, man. And uh, I grew up around the dirt, spent the weekend in the sand with my dad at the beach. And uh, so, I, I, you know, I had the best of all worlds. And, uh, yeah, it wasn't hard for me to sort of fall into this pattern. What did you make of the Speedway itself at the early stage? Did it, did it, was it more about just going to the event and doing all the other collecting things? Or did you actually take in the racing? You know, like any kid, man, I think it was uh, at that point, it was just uh, it was exciting, something to do. It was the noise being underneath the grandstands and getting people's drinks spilled on you or or uh, dirt flying through as the riders came by and uh, the whole thing running around trying to avoid it. I, You know, I got hooked very, very quickly. And um, the fact that my dad and Charlie were became friends with some of the riders, Bruce Penhall and 
and the John Cooks and Segalases, all these guys who were, some of them were local guys at that time. Uh, to be a youngster getting introduced to the sport and then becoming friends with some of the rising stars at that point, you're just like, uh, you, you know, you couldn't help but get interested. And, uh, you know, here I am now so many years later, obviously the, uh, you know, it stuck. <laughs> so what was the first bike you had when you uh, popped on the speedway scene? I had a Triumph Tiger Cub, a 200 CC was the first motor I had in a, in a half scale uh, King frame. I think it was a frame that my dad got from Lance King's dad, if I got it correct. And, um, I remember that was, that was one of those and then <laughs> speedway bikes that I thought was never going to be finished. Dad was working on that thing and working on that thing and working on that thing. And it was like, dude, I just want to go ride, you know, <laughs> that makes it so much more special though, doesn't it? Oh man. You know, and I was working on it with him and helping him paint the fenders and paint the frames. My dad's an automotive custom painter. So okay. everything was done you know, in the process. And this whole thing probably took six months, but it feels like six years. How old would you have been then? So probably, I think he started building my bike when I was around eight, probably eight years old. And I started racing when I was nine. So at that stage, I, I tried some bikes that were around. My brother was already racing at that stage. So he was, the more he was riding, the more I was just like, this is ridiculous. You know, <laughs> I, I got to do this. And, uh, uh, my dad finally finished that bike and I, I rode some, some other bikes that were around just to try it out and things, you know, you're reaching out. I couldn't even reach the handlebars. My arms were straight out. So you just kind of leaned in the corners, you know, you couldn't do much more than that. And, um, by the time I was sort of eight, eight and a half or something like that, my bike was rolling and, um, it was game on, you know, I remember the first race I did at Costa Mesa and if, if I got a slide on, it was only because the track was really wet. <laughs> yeah uh we've all done that and i've then then you try to replicate it when it's dry and it goes horribly wrong so oh yes but oh, so yes. was it any other bikes or was it always just speedway was it like motocross or trail bikes or anything you know we i had my dad kind of made sure that i knew how to ride a motorcycle before i went straight onto the speedway bike and my brother had uh previously he had a yz60 uh little motocross bike i don't remember the year of it but the thing was there probably early to mid seventies or something that one. So it was, Oh no, probably even earlier because that thing was old when I got on it. So, and this was like mid seventies. <laughs> so, um, I learned how to ride on that thing and then, uh, basically got the fundamentals of, you know, stop and go and how to, uh, how to use the, the clutch and all that kind of stuff. And, um, then he let put me straight onto the speedway bike and it just, I always had like an XR 80, a little motocross bike or something to play on. That was my first brand new motorcycle in 1982. And, uh, that became my, my start mechanism, you know, cookie, John cook taught me how to do starts on my XR 80 and, uh, back at that time and learning how to put it in second gear. So you had to really <laughs> feather the clutch to make the thing go. And I was a little dude, but he was, taught you well, he, he wasn't bad. Right. So, um, I still talk to that guy virtually every day these days. And, uh, uh, it's pretty fun to reminisce, but I owe a lot to that dude. I mean, there's so many good guys I was fortunate to grow up around, but I think that guy in particular probably has more hours in me than anybody. Just thinking about that, I mean, you, you mentioned Cookie, and, and we know there was a relationship with Bruce growing up. I mean, just list some of the people that had an influence on you growing up and developing into a senior speedway rider. Man, I don't want to bum anybody out, but I was... I was very, very fortunate. My, my dad and, uh, meeting all the people that he did. And, you know, I was a, I was a pretty nice kid. I think I don't, I didn't say much, but I just smiled all the time. So that's why my nickname is grin, but, uh, you had from starting with Bobby Schwartz and then it was Bruce Penhall lived in the same area. Dennis Segalis was in the same area. So these guys were like a regular group of dudes growing up on their own and, and, uh, racing motorcycles, having a blast. And, uh, a lot of them were beach goers. Um, John Cook came around at a pretty early age. Keith Crisco or some other names back in the day. Um, Sean McConnell. I, I had all these dudes. Steve Lucero was very influential as well. And um, there, there's so many guys around. And then, you know, as the, as the thing started to grow, it was like um, Bobby lived with us for a lot of years on Balboa Island. So that's, he's became more of like a family member for us because he was, and Bobby was really, you know, he's, really strict and hard on what he does, but he was a serious motorcycle racer. So he didn't want us to screw up. 
um, and taught you, you know, you got to do it like this and you got to make sure you don't screw up, make sure this is right. And, and, um, and then that, that all kind of transformed and moved on. And then we were, the Moran brothers were coming around. I mean, it was like, our house was like, uh, it was a Mecca of Speedway dudes just kind of rolling through there constantly. And all I had to do was be a big sponge and soak it all up. And, um, you know, everybody liked my dad. He was, you know, I think he's just an older version of me and, and the heck of a lot nicer and more patient dude than even I am. So, um, and I think I'm pretty nice and patient. You're really just a younger version of him. Not, he's not an older version of you. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I figured I got that wrong somewhere. <laughs> Man, there was such a fleet of like American. I remember there was a kid kind of whenever there was like the test matches and like, like Cookie was a guy that, you know, like is a good friend now, but was like a hero to me when I was a kid. And like you said, you had so many good American guys around you that you could just soak it all up from. Um, is it a bit of a shame now that there's, oh, but there is still some really good riders coming through. I mean, Luke Becker's really, really impressed me. But um, do you feel it's a little bit of a shame that there's not the same sort of fleet of guys coming through now that there was? Absolutely. Uh, I think this is probably a, a regular topic these days because uh, there there isn't that flood of guys. And, and you know, it's as, as frustrating as it is, it's understandable because it's a different world today too, right? I mean, it's um, the, the, the world of, of this has kind of yeah. taken over everybody's lives. And um, it's a good thing for the sport because there's so much media and there's so much activity and you can kind of see Speedway anytime you want now. So back in those days, the, there was a lot of Americans already racing in Europe. England in particular, that was the place to be, right? You had to go to the UK before you could do, well, that there was only the UK. Yeah. And uh, the best training ground, I still think it's probably one of the best training grounds if you can get your foot in the door somewhere. And, um, you know, I, I remember if there was like 15 or, or 16 Americans maybe in the UK when I came over in 89. So there's always been a flood or, or like this natural progression, right? You you had heroes and I got to, I got to live with Lance King. So here's another name, right? Lance, I watched grow up from junior speedway right up through doing what he did and, and almost winning a world championship. And here I was my first year living in his house in, in England, getting the red carpet rolled out for me, but it was also like really strict and hardcore schooling of you, you work hard and you can play hard, but you got to work hard first. <laughs> and the, um, it, that installs all the software. So, I had it so lucky in that sense. And then moving on to Eric Gunderson's house for a year, it was just like all these things went on and on and on. But there was always a group of Americans around that were, you know, we hung out, you know, when there wasn't a race night, we got together and did a lot of things, helped each other out. I was at the races with, with Lance King and Sam Malenko and all these guys on nights that I wasn't racing just to work on their bikes with them or be a mechanic. And so I was learning all the time while I was racing too. So. Um, Times were different, you know, you wouldn't, not a lot of guys will do that today. Luke Becker is one who will. And uh, I think Brock Nichols, another one, he's these guys that they, they go to the races and they race and they will work on bikes. They would come in and be a mechanic for, for you. If you called them and said, dude, I need some help tonight. Right. But a lot of guys don't want to make that call. However, they would never say no. They would love to get in there and get their hands dirty and try to learn something new from you uh, in the process. So I think that. The feeling of them not really having another American hero or heroes to look up to and follow in the footsteps of that makes for me, that makes um, uh, that's a big part of this whole this whole gig. And uh, if there were more of, you know, I, I, I had a good run and not everybody probably looks up to me in that sense over there. But uh, if there was more of us, I'm, I'm sure that they could start to dream again. And uh, it's uh, kind of a natural progression from there. Do you remember at what age you kind of started to decide that Speedway was going to be what Greg Hancock did maybe for a living and, and maybe particularly when you when you decided or thought, I really want to go and give a European Speedway a go? Probably that deciding factor was in, in what, September of 1981. Oh, yes. You know, yeah. Wem Wembley and Penn Hall winning a world championship. He was already my hero. And then he wins the world championship and I'm like, that's that's me right there that's what i want to do and uh he he pretty much um yeah he put the bar where where it needed to be for me and i just chased that goal and no matter what it was a no-brainer for me at that age that 
I was like, going to go to England at some stage. I was going to go to Europe and I was going to go chase the world championship. And um, that's kind of pretty much how it went. You know, I struggled and I struggled for a lot of years and, uh, but I had the best teacher. So, uh, you know, Bobby Schwartz said to me before I left, just remember California is not going anywhere. It's always going to be here. So, uh, um, and there's guys that said, you know, it's, it's okay uh, not to make it and to fail and come home. You know, it's, and I thought, fail, I, there's, I can't fail, you know, <laughs> who wants to fail? And um, that was my goal, man. You have to give up life. You have to give up your, your family, your friends, the culture, the food. And that's one of the things today that a lot of the young Americans probably aren't prepared to do. You know, it's, uh, they go over there for, you know, they want to go race speedway and they want to make money and all that. And, um, you have to ask yourself, you know, is this really what I want to do? And you're not going to make money right off the bat. You have to win races and you have to establish yourself. And, you know, like anything, the money comes uh, with the success and, um, I never tried to look at it as going for the money because it's then it was a job. And for me, Speedway was never a job. No, uh, you know what? And I think you're right. It's interesting spoken to a few rides. And even with the Grand Prix, it's when you chat to rides and things, it seems like the Australians, the Americans, the ones that have to give up so much, I think it makes you stronger because you, you, you've come with a purpose and you know, yes, you, if it fails, you can go back. But you don't want to fail. So you dig in. And I think, like British Speedway was the mecca, it was the place to come. And I think for a lot of British riders, it was almost too easy. And, and like I said, even now, there's so many riders, they don't want to get their hands dirty. They kind of want everything done for them. You know, it's almost a bit of the silver spoon mentality. And and people sometimes go about the good old days, but it's more about, I think, when you, when you do go through the route, you've been through and so many of those other, you know, international riders, it, it makes you more determined and you're learning all the time. Um, before you came to the UK, obviously, like you said, Britain was the place to be, um, but we didn't have the internet and stuff now, then. So how much did you know about the British scene and the riders and things like that? And if so, was there any riders that as a young pup coming to the UK, you were like, oh, I'm not sure about going up against him because there's always some, some bad riders out there that you don't want to be rubbing elbows with. We were lucky because we had the Speedway star. And uh, Bobby Schwartz Bible. set that, right? <laughs> uh, Bobby Schwartz set that up for us, uh, for my dad, uh, when he went over there in 1979. And um, I don't remember what year my dad started getting the Speedway Star, but it was pretty early at that stage. And uh, so we were getting the weekly Speedway Stars sent over, uh, or whatever it was. I, I was only at my dad's every other weekend. So when it got there, I had a weekend of catching up on you know, uh, on every Speedway star that was coming around and, and reading about what was happening and who was doing what and checking out, watching all the scores and the stats at the back that Brando just gives us now. We don't have to look anymore. So it's, yeah. um, <laughs> it's, uh, that back then you had to, had something to read, you know, that was the Bible for me and school was a waste of my time. So thank God for the Speedway star, because I could read a lot of good pictures and I could, you know, check out the stats. And that was all I needed to know pictures and numbers, what was going on. <laughs> Um, that was it. So yeah, I, when I came to Europe, I, I, uh, I was pretty knowledgeable about riders and tracks and although I didn't know how to find them or what was really going on, I felt like I knew them all. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Um, they were, they were awesome. Dude, those were the best times because it was to come in there. I, you know, I knew so much, but I knew nothing at all. And, uh, it was just, I, diving into a world of like you're in a living in a dreamland and just absorbing everything you know it's like seeing guys like john davis and simon wig and kelvin tatum and all these dudes that the eric undersons the hans nielsen's that a lot of these guys had come over to the u.s at some point for the world team cup at long beach so you got to have a little bit of a sneak peek of what they were like and uh, because bobby schwartz and cookie these guys were friends with all these dudes so they were talking to them like they were you and i are bros you know and you're like, wow, he knows, he knows Eric Gunderson. Oh my gosh. Cookie knows everybody, you know? And, um, then you go to Europe and suddenly those guys are everywhere and you see them and they're normal guys. You know, you're like, but you put them on a pedestal, right? So you, no matter if they were a, a hero or they were the guy that you were, you didn't like because you read in the speed of star that he gave, you know, Sam or Malenko a shove in the first corner and what a jerk, you know, <laughs> so you, it was, it was that kind of, um, yeah, camaraderie. Who was the ride that gave the elbows? 
Was there, was there a rider? So when you were looking through the Speedway Stars then, was there a rider that kind of you seem to, you know, like now they do the match, everything's on the internet, it's still the match reports. And if you read the match reports, you would be like, there's a couple of riders that seem to have a bit of a reputation here. That They seem to be the ones <laughs> doing the rubbing all the time. Was there a rider or a couple of riders back then before you came over that you thought, oh, he seems like a bit of a handful? Well, I mean, for us, we always read about the Kenny Carter issues with Bruce Penhall. So you always look for him. So he was the guy that we were like, oh, you know, that that was the <laughs> the razzmatazz. <laughs> but you had guys like him. I remember reading reading about um, uh, like Neil Evitz being the dive bomber, you know, the hard guy that would look at you and pull his tear offs off right in front of you before you went to the starting line. And, you know, all these stories I would get from different guys and or read about it and for me, I, I think at that stage, I, I just, Kenny Carter was one I would watch. Um, who else did I remember? Um, I remember Dave Jessup being the guy who was so fast and so good and always the dude who broke down in the important meetings. And you're like, what? How, how does this happen? You know, it, it, it's amazing. Um, you know, the Collins brothers, I, I can't say any of these guys I ever really looked at as being the really hard ones. I just looked at them as like, they were just, they were the bomb, man. They, these guys were all good. And um, I, I don't think there was any, it was Kenny Carter, I think, just because, just because. Because of Bruce. Dude, just because of Bruce. Thanks, Bruce. You, you put him, you put him there. <laughs> yeah. And Kenny, and Kenny was, Kenny was amazing, right? The guy was oh yeah, insane. So good. So good. So, uh, you know, sad story, but what a way to, uh, what a heck of a writer. I, I when I, I was very lucky the first meeting I ever saw in England in 1985 he was riding a Halifax at the Shea and you kind of just that was a crazy track and he just made it look so easy to up to the fence and back down long straight he just seemed to have everything on a motorbike it was he was crazy talented yeah and sitting on the back fender going into the corners <laughs> only his it can do that now yeah yeah that's right exactly <laughs> right yeah he's bringing back he's retro he can do it in the middle of the corners. Yeah, he just does it. <laughs> yeah. So coming to the UK, I mean, it's been, I mean, that was obviously where it all started for you. Um, you've spoken about Bobby a lot. I mean, he was like the godfather, wasn't he? Really? He was the one that yeah. kind of set everything up and kind of overlooked all the guys. Um, you said you had to give up so much, um, so many kind of um normalities in your life and obviously different languages. I mean, we have so many different expressions. So, was it a bit of a minefield when you first come over and what were your kind of first memories of coming to the UK? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and I didn't realize what I was doing, giving up all these things until I actually was there and it was done and you're going, then suddenly you get to a point probably in a low, you know, when you first come over, it's the weather is always talked about, right. And your the food is always talked about and traveling from, you know, your, your home base. And I was in Tamworth to get to Oxford back in those periods, you didn't just go down the M42 to the M40 and get straight down into Oxford in, in a, you know, an hour and a bit. It was, it was like a three hour trip or two and a half hour trip going through Stratford and all these little small roads and everything. And um, so all that kind of stuff, it, it didn't actually really sink in until I was having low periods where you're not a lot of racing and you weren't scoring points. And, you know, if you weren't scoring points, you weren't even making enough money to really, do much you know thank god i was living with lance king and i had a place you know and he wasn't going to boot me out he was getting paid by the club to keep me there anyway but uh you know when you want to go out to eat with your friends and you don't have that extra couple of quid just to go get yourself something to eat and or um you know go buy a little bit extra food for the house it was it was like that so you you grew up really fast although i had the security of lance would never let me starve i still had the fear of i don't want to ask him for anything you know because I'm already getting everything. And uh, uh, that was the time when you started reflecting on, I wonder if I made the right choice. Did I want to do this? And my, I miss my family. I miss my friends. And gosh, it was so easy living at home. And, you know, my dad gave me a thousand bucks or something when I left and good luck, son. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's about all we could afford to do. And, um, but at some point Lance would come home and dude, come on, we got to do this. And then you're, your mind switches, you know, and you're back in the garage or you're in the car going to Kings Lynn or going to wherever we were going. And, and suddenly it was all gone and you're just, you're revived and you're going strong. And the next night you scored four points and you made some money and you're like, rad, <laughs> you know, and then it was game on again. And uh, I think that's the part that 
I was lucky because I had Lance King. And if I didn't have him, I, I don't know what would have happened. You say that, that that whole support network at that time, and maybe slightly before you first came over, that the sort of camaraderie and meeting up. I know they all used to meet at the Hard Rock Cafe in London after Wimbledon matches, maybe in the early 80s and stuff. That To have that support network when you got here must have been amazing. It was amazing. And we we had um, TGI Fridays in Birmingham at that stage. So that was our Hard Rock. And uh, for us, you know, I mean, at that stage, you think about England today, uh, compared to what it was when I was there, compared to what it was when Bobby Schwartz started going there, like the food networks, the U.S. Is, was always stacked full of fast food and a little bit of everything, right? And then you came to, the, to England and there was McDonald's in random spots. Uh, and then, you know, KFC came later. There was Taco Bell touched, touched the ground for a short period too. And, uh, but you had to go to London for that stuff. So we, we would do these, you know, we would all, all of us would show up or end up at TGI Fridays in Birmingham. And um, all the American guys would show up there and, the, you know, Rick Miller and, and Sean or Kelly or, you know, one of them or both of them and Sam and Ronnie Corey and all these guys, we would all end up there on a night. And it was like, you're in that American atmosphere. And suddenly you've just, until you walked outside or somebody spoke to you, you didn't even know that you weren't home. So it was, um, I think those kind of things, you found your, your comfort zones and um, that, that went a long way. Definitely. And then that makes a huge difference. But then obviously you really quickly started to spread your wings, started racing abroad in Sweden and Poland and places like that. And then kind of we fast forward a little bit to the Grand Prix. Um, I, you had the longest, Brando had the stats, you had the longest career in the Grand Prix. Um, how did you sustain the the will and the determination to do it, you know, it, like traveling all over the world probably mentally drains you more than anything else. The physical bit's probably the easy bit with Speedway. Um, just how did you keep the fire alive for so long? I think every time you came to the racetrack, the smell, the, the vibration, the noise, that just took everything away. And it was like, uh, one thing it would go, you know, for me, it was uh, no matter how tired I was, no matter how hungry I was, no matter how exhausted or excited you were, as soon as I put the helmet on, everything went away, right? It was just like the nerves and everything just went away. And it was just like you and you get in the zone and there's nothing better literally than for me is riding your motorcycle down the straightaway at, you know, 70 plus miles an hour and throwing it sideways. And it was just like, that was just that made everything good again. And um, I, I honestly can only say that I love Speedway and I really love getting sideways. And it's uh, something I learned at a very young age. So it was really easy for me to to turn to Speedway to, to keep a, a good focus. Because uh, if you were having a bad day, if you were angry, you were sad, you were you know stressed, when you got on the Speedway bike, you could not think about all that stuff because you have to focus on what you're doing, right? Otherwise, it could end up really bad. And um, I could get off the bike and uh, feel great. You know, you had you had moments where you're, you know, you banged your head a few times and you're you're walking a little bit like this for a few days and you get on the motorcycle and you think maybe I shouldn't be doing this. But as soon as you focus, everything goes straight again. <laughs> or oh, you think it goes straight again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Does that take you way back to when you first started, like, do you remember those feelings from when you were a kid, like when you first got that? Because at first it's almost like a nervous energy. You're excited, but you're a little bit nervous. And then then there's something that sort of kind of like clicks and you get that that buzz, that adrenaline of, of pushing yourself to the limit. So like you're saying, when you put your helmet on, does that ever take you back to when you first started? You know, it, it always does. And I think that um, we all have a routine, right? You have something that you do every single time you get prepared for a race. And I'm sure you probably got something that even if you don't think about it until you actually go to put your boots on the next time or go to put your helmet on or set up your gear bag or whatever you do, there's, there is a routine that, that I follow and I've done my whole career. Right. And, uh, I, until someone talks about it, do I, yeah, do I put my right boot on first? Yeah, I do put my right boot on first every single time or put my, you know, a process that you do and it all stems back. And I, I think the one thing that sticks out the most is the smell. If you go away and we spend a lot of time at the beach now, you know, because we're close to not too far from the coast and in the U S and 
when I come back to the house and you open the garage, the smell of the oil and the dirt and Speedway, it's that smell that is there. When that comes on, I have a flashback of Costa Mesa Speedway being a kid running through the grandstands underneath. It it never goes away. And it's like, it's, uh, some people might laugh and think it's crazy, right? But it's like the most motivating smell. When I smell it, I'm like, you just want to go ride your bike. I mean, is that one of the big things that allowed you to carry on so enthusiastically for so long? More than likely, yeah, because it was like I, I, I want I loved racing, I really loved winning, and it's uh, I knew that there was going to be the balance of of good and bad or or pros and cons, and and uh, but I uh, I never wanted to leave an you know leave a result not as good. I never tried to look at it as a bad result. I just tried to look at it as it could have been better. And uh, that was me. I, my positive thinking was like, oh, that it could have been better. You know, next time will be, it will be better. And I just always wanted to be a little bit better. No matter if I won a world championship, I, I look back on them and you, you stand on top of the podium and you're like, you're so freaking stoked, right? Like I just did it. And then the next thing is like, okay, I gotta, how am I going to do this next year? And suddenly you like, all the emotions and everything start to go away because you start thinking about next year. You're all excited, but you're always thinking about, dude, I got to beat these guys again next year. And you start going like that. And then the wheels keep going. And um, uh, probably sometimes you wish you would have celebrated a little bit more, but um, you know, I had a good time anyway. So, you know, that's something that I really want to kind of tap into more is that, that part of it. Um, before we do that, because I want to do that in more in depth, um, we want to do the little talent with a talent bit. And I'm curious now as to what you said earlier, because Brando, I mean, he's got to have more than just talent to ride the motorcycle, you reckon? Yeah, I think there's there's got to be hidden stuff under there. You can't be so good at one thing and not be good at lots of others. Go on in, Greg. What's the talent with a talent? Dude, I don't have a video of this, but I could probably reenact it for you. And I can, I'm gonna, I'm going to paint you a picture, but... Um, it involves a blender. It involves ice, coconut snow powder, like a, a powdered form of coconut, orange juice, and is this where you turn in Tom Cruise? Dude, I was Tom Cruise when I was about ten years old. So I have I left out one valuable ingredient <laughs> that, fortunately, during those times back in the day, things were a little different than they are today. But if you can picture this, Balboa Island is the most amazing place in the world for me. Because growing up there too, and uh, Scott's been there. Uh, probably Brando, you've probably been down there too, I would imagine. Uh, it is like this little dream paradise. You drive onto this little island in Newport Beach. And when you drive onto that island, life is different. It's like a little dream world. Very wealthy people live on that island. And we live there too. We just weren't wealthy. <laughs> My dad rented a really bitchin' little apartment, and at that house, on the back, there's alleys, and everybody has a single car garage or a double car garage, or you know, these houses are they're mansions, some of them in a small area. Uh, but in the that alley, so many things happened back there. We had the the dirt lot across the alley from us, and these were really narrow. We would have do speedway uh, with Cookie. We'd throw sand out in the alley, and we'd slide our bikes. But periodically during the year, there'd be it end up being a little party in the in the alley. And we would set up benches and it would be me and Josh Larson and David Busby and, and Trina Cirillo and Jesse Finch, all these guys that were in our group at that stage, we would be the bartenders and there would be my dad and there would be various other riders that were very supportive of us. And um, this is, I think, probably one of the biggest things where we learned about alcohol and what you should do. And, you know, you shouldn't do it when you're when you're young. And, and I honestly believe this because. Uh, they would let us mix drinks for the guys. And we made a drink that my dad <laughs> uh, eventually named and he called it the Spodiote. And uh, it was it was a mixture of ice, orange juice. It was coconut snow. And I think it was a, it was a rum. It was a white rum. And you mix that and there was something else you threw in there too. And you mix that up and we would serve Spodiotes to some very famous people. I'm going to try and make one of them tonight. <laughs> it sounds good. Dude. They were, they were, uh, I did try when, at, at, when I was 21, of course. And, um, <coughs> yeah, it was, you know. Is that something where we can say we'll post the recipe on all of our social media <laughs> later? Is that, yeah. is that, is that yeah, that's right. Yeah. 
Check back on our links. Slash. Yeah, the Spody Odie. You got to give me the spelling on it. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I don't even know if there's an official spelling, but we'll make one up. Yeah, <laughs> there is now. So, dude, that was that was the those were some of the best times. And I mean, you know, sometimes you'd mix one, you'd see the you know one of the guys take a drink and they're like, whoa. <laughs> Nobody ever said anything. They just whoa. They would walk away, you know. And sometimes they'd ask for a little bit more too, right? <laughs> yeah. Did they, they ask for more as the night went on? <laughs> exactly right. Kelly or Sean, who asked for more? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. So okay. Well, that is that is a talent. So like Greg the it Green is. Hancock, aka Tom Bruce. Dude, like, Tom. I, yeah, right. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't Maverick. <laughs> no, um Wingman. Uh no, so I really want to go into the this mental side of it game. It was really interesting what you were just saying because I think in every walk of life, so many people have routines and actually are kind of probably more tapped into the mental aspect than they realize, like whether it's they sit at their desk and they do things a certain way. So for you, obviously hugely talented, did you work really hard on your mental game or is it something that just came naturally? Uh, I, I don't think it came naturally because I was, I was a sponge. So I watched every rider. I got to see guys like Bobby Schwartz. I got, if we talk about, go back even to Dave Jessup, right? And I think about, he's a good example of, okay, mental, but mechanical. And you think, how would you go through your career being so good? And then that one engine failure that could cost you everything, right? And um, his name always stands out when I talk about this, because I remember listening to the guys talk about him, reading about it in the paper. So, you know, I, I heard everything. I didn't have to say anything. I just was kind of around. I was the fly on the wall as a kid. And, um, uh, uh, guys like that, I, I would watch and I would listen to him. And Bobby Schwartz was one who, for me, was the one who probably stood out a lot because he was so serious and he was so focused and he was such a good starter. He had all the ingredients. When it was a team event, watch out, right? Bobby would be a leader and he was the leader of the American team for a lot of years. And you would they won so many team events. When it came down down to individual, except for the American, the U.S. national championships, when it came to individual, Bobby struggled and couldn't, I shouldn't say struggled, but he couldn't take the next level. And then there was, you know, you had Bruce and you had Siggy and you had the Morans and you had Cookie and Lansky, all these guys who were always there too. But it seemed like for some reason, Bobby, when he was on his own in the world championship, for some reason, things didn't work. And I tried to figure out, was it equipment? Was it this? Or was it just mental? And could he just not, as a team person, he was like the nucleus. Everybody was there and, and they were all gathered around and Bobby was that he would hit, take the first punch, right? And um, set everybody off in winning ways. And when it came on his own, it was like, did he not have the backup? Was that why he couldn't do it? He was all on his own? Or was it just, that's the pressure of, you know, doing it for yourself and wanting to win and and learning to find a way forward. So uh, I, I watched and I listened and I had a lot of heroes growing up, uh, from other sports too. And obviously from basketball world, you know, you, you had the Michael Jordans and then Jeremy McGrath was one of my heroes, but Jeff Ward before that, all these dudes that motocross for me was always exciting. I grew up around the Busby family too, in, in the U S and they were all car racers. So we spent a lot of time at uh, Riverside raceway for the endurance races. So you got to see a lot of those dudes, the drag racing with the Cirillo family. We, we went to so many different forms of racing and you got to see the mental, the, the, the promotional, the media, and you get to see these guys in front of the TV cameras. And you think that dude just won a race. And now they put a camera in his face and he's sweating and he's got to, you know, explain his story and, and how do they hold their composure, you know? So I was always curious of just learning by, watching and how guys reacted. I've worked with various sports therapists over the years for very short periods. I never worked with anybody for very long because I would take a little bit from each one and then process it myself and make it work for me. And um, I think that goes the same with racing a motorcycle. You, I can't teach you how to make a start, but I can show you and I can give you some advanced, you know, some ideas and and make a few points. And then you have to make yourself into Scott Nichols, a good starter and um find your way that. right <laughs> i'm <Yeah>. terrible <laughs> so, uh, but it was all those things i i i think that i i learned by 
watching and understanding. Bruce Penhall was, for me, I could never figure out like that guy could be, um, you know, if, if you take the Kenny Carter instances and, you, and some of the other stuff that he did, when any, whatever anybody tried to give him a hard time or make some stories, he always came back with something sarcastic and he just went out on the track and just made it happen, right? And like, God, I want to be like that. But I'm not the sarcastic one either. I can't say the things that some of these guys will say because I'll be like, ah, karma's going to get me. <laughs> 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 so I'm just going to be quiet. I'll do my talking on the track and then I'll just go away and, and tell my story, you know? <laughs> But that's really interesting because the psychology, like it's a massive part of it has been from day one, but obviously now there's so much more focus on it. Um, you know, you look at the riders back in the day, I remember um, kind of seeing it like a snippet, like of Ivor major. And it was saying that like, he, he just seemed like he was mentally always in that place. It was like, he had to open the door first. He had to be top of the stairs. It was always like that that will succeed, but it's something that probably just ingrains in you. But it's interesting. You said you only work with, you've worked with people for short periods of time and you, you take out what works for you. I think that's the key. I think a lot of people, um, I wasn't mentally very, that's where I felt I was probably like the Bobby Schwartz of the Grand Prix. Mentally I, I struggled with it and I don't think I went as far as I perhaps could have done. And, and I saw a, a kind of a psychologist try and help and, for a period of, I went backwards because I was overanalyzed absolutely everything and it was too much. And then I picked out the bits that worked and now I feel like I'm in a better place, but it's too late. And I think, but I think some people just naturally perhaps have it in them. I don't know. What do you reckon? There, there's probably a natural thing there that helps you to uh, understand that, right. And make it work for you. And um, you know, it's uh, whether it, you call it being too late or this is like where you are now, it's, like you can see what you're doing in life. You're still doing what you love and racing and, and still doing really good at it. And you got a lot of other stuff going on too, that probably this is all going to translate into something different and you're going to be very good at it as well. Right. So it all registers at some point the way I look at it. And I got to that point too, when working with a sports psychologist that I, I didn't want them to get too deep because then when I started getting that deep, I started thinking about other stuff and I'm like, Man, I just want to go race. You know, I don't want to, dig into so much and um whether they it wasn't like the it's like psychiatrist trying to get into your your past and what you did but yeah you heard stories of guys trying to recreate or re um, um yeah like recreate a crash that they had that maybe there's a mental block there right so let's recreate this crash and let's make it kind of happen and show how you actually came out of it rather than focusing on being in it and getting hurt and crashing and this and that. And, you know, you hear those stories. I'm like, Whoa, man, I don't even want to think about that. You know, I just want <laughs> yeah. to like, I want to get, I want to get past this, you know, and just, I'm looking past the yeah, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, I, think, I think it's interesting though, Greg, because Ivan major always just say that like you very much touched upon earlier, you can teach someone to do something. You can teach someone to ride a motorcycle, but, the one thing he said you could never teach is desire. If the person doesn't have the desire to make themselves better and improve. And I, and I saw that in you. I was very privileged to be up close to you at the Grand Prix for a long time. And you're always practicing, always testing. You know, you, you, would, you would take punches in a Grand Prix for testing, you know, tubeless tyres. But you would take that because it was the step of improving. And how hard is it to teach someone that? I don't know that you can teach someone that, you know, um, it's the same with talent, right? There's a lot of guys who are talented. As Scott is kind of talking about this too. It's, it's, uh, you cannot, uh, it's hard to beat talent. So some guys out there, and I think Luke Becker is a prime example. He is not naturally talented to be the perfect speeder rider, but he has the most amazing work ethic and he is determined to figure it out. And he will, I, I'm confident he's, he's doing really good now, but it's, uh, with Luke, you know, he's got a different uh, mentality and, you know, he was really good at a really young age. And I think that he got, he got stuck in a pattern that, and a lot of people telling him how good he was, cause he was good. And then you start to believe that you're, you're really good and he is good, but there's, there's a difference in trying to be better, or you can just always think you're good and you're going to be stuck there. Right. And you can always be better. And that's that's how I look at it. And the desire to be, I can't win just by going full gas. You know, I've always thought that. I, and I'm not a crazy rider. I've never been a crazy rider. And I, I'm not a dirty rider. And 
And um, I understood that you could be a little bit more technical, have good equipment. And it took me a long time to realize uh, really how much more you can do by testing and trying new things. And if you believe in something, don't give up, but you really got to believe it. That desire is what I did with, you know, playing with different tires and different wheels and different exhausts and frames. And I mean, the amount of times with, with chassis that the, the testing we did with the guys at pro drive, uh, I ended up, I rang my bell so many times and, (laughs) and destroyed a couple, two or three bikes in the process, whether it was here in Europe or in the States. And, uh, you get off it going like, that was pretty good, but man, we got, (laughs) maybe we got to go back to the drawing board on this, you know? And, um, (laughs) Was we it never good because up. it was good? Or is it good because your yeah, <laughs> bell was still ringing around? <laughs> I'm still not sure about that one. <laughs> I think it was good, but I'm not sure. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I I believe desire is a lot, and if you don't have it in you, you know, I obviously where I am today and what I'm doing right now with Roslov and and uh, assisting Magic a little bit too, I I see. So I'm on the other side of the fence in a way you know, and you're looking at it and you see how all these guys are and you see the competition and you see how focused some guys are on each other, which I um, probably, I was always focused on specific guys, but I didn't put, I didn't want to ride like exactly like that guy. I didn't want to do everything he did. And I think a lot of the guys around today are trying too hard to be like one person. And um, you can take a little bit from everybody and adapt it to yourself. And the same with, we talk about the sports psychologist. I think for me, I tried to take a little bit of everything that everybody was doing, give it a try and make myself into Greg Hancock, the speedway guy and be a little bit better. Cause I can't ride like Darcy Ward, um, who's, you know, who's insane. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> and, and no, and you see, he, he's a prime example of how he, you know, the, what he did so well, and uh, not a lot of guys can do that. You know, I mean, I don't really know anybody that can do it <laughs> at this stage, but then you have smarts like who's got another style. The idea is, to, you know, you got to find a way to get your bike in a specific position to get the max amount of the tire tread on the or tire pattern on the ground. And, and Darcy knew how to do that. He could be, his head could be on the ground, but the bike was straight up and, um, you know, and still going forward. So there's a lot of these things. You try to take a little bit of that. And then the starting techniques from, from a Hans Nielsen, if I go back to him, to an Eric, you know, Eric Gunderson is my ultimate hero. Hans Nielsen was very, very special. There was something about him and that, uh, you know, I've got to have a few conversations with him over the last uh, four or five years of uh, even through before I finished riding that uh, to see him in those races they would have in Lublin and talk to him a little bit about the past. And, um, you know, he's in another place in life now too. So he's a little more open to just talk about what he did before it was, you know, he's not going to tell you anything, right? You want to go play golf? <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So now your role has changed. Um, interesting what you just said about Hans Nielsen. So is there like, you've got this role and like you to tell us a bit more about what you're doing at Rotswald now. Um, but is there stuff now that you feel that you would have maybe not shared when you were in your prime? Because that was kind of your, everyone's got their kind of, I wouldn't say trade secret, but like their little thing that works for them that they don't really want to share. Are you in a, like now you're like a totally open book now? No, I'm not an open book at all. You know, I, I probably give a little bit more information to those that I feel really want to win. And, um, that's for me, it's all about like, if you want to win. And I, uh, I learned that phrase from a fabricator, the guy named Jeff Haywood that's been working with me or worked with me for, from my, from 2013, 14, and on up. And, um, you know, thanks to him, I, I had a lot of success, two world championships. Um, they're all combinations, you know, everything you do, you, there's a lot of, uh, ingredients that go into this thing, but that guy changed me a lot. He was a car racer himself. He worked with, he raced Indy. He worked with uh, Dan Gurney and all these guys in the U S and amazing fabricator. So he did some things for me that uh, he's the reason why I started with the tubeless tires at that period when we went through it. And, uh, you know, we had to go back and forth because the tires aren't, were not working for that um, for a while, but uh, you know, we didn't give up and um, he made the quote to me one day that I think he got from Dan Gurney and he just said, well, don't you want to win? You know? And I just thought, damn, right. Yeah, of course I want to win. Yeah. Hashtag. And that's where it started. And uh, 
uh, for me, that's, that's all part of it, right? It's just who really wants to win. You know, you can have your period of doing whatever, but um, a flat tire or, you know, a broken frame or, you know, the, I, I don't know, some ignition problem that you went through or, or something didn't work. Right. And do you just give up, you throw in the towel. Do you, do you not try to make a really bitching air box? Do you not try to change the, the, the exhaust system and whatever? And, you know, people put so much focus on one area when they see one guy doing good that they actually forget about something else that they're doing. And that's the key. The sheep mentality. There you go. And probably a brutally honest question. Um, you just said about the desire. Now, one of the, one of your proteges who's an amazingly talented rider, Masha Yanofsky, um, it seems like that tiny, tiny little piece of the jigsaw that's missing is possibly the mental game. But do you feel that that's is the mental aspect or do you feel it's perhaps a slight lack of desire towards the end? Because it always seems like he starts exceptionally strong and then just starts to slightly fade away. Um, interesting you're saying about desire because you get someone like Nicky Pedersen, who's not a very talented rider, not disrespectfully, but that just desire and will to succeed is like, no, I don't think there's many people out there that have the same kind of just grit and determination that he had. So is that perhaps something that you think magic's maybe missing? Without a doubt, there's been something there. I can't put my finger on it, you know, because I, I, I'm stoked to hear people like you say that he's a uh, my protege, you know. But like the kid, just he has been. He reminded me so much of myself when he was younger too, and he couldn't speak in English at all for the longest time. And he was helping Raphael and driving to GPs and driving to back and forth to Sweden and pulling and driving my van when he was 12 years old, and I didn't know that until recently. <laughs> driving down motorways in Sweden and when Raph was sleeping in the back and told him to keep it under 110 <laughs> so, no, I... kilometers an hour that is yeah and I'm like what and, you know we laugh about it now and uh, uh, but a guy like him was a sponge well that's what you you said earlier about you were a sponge when you were a kid and you were very fortunate to land in sort of a rich environment as a sponge to soak up that stuff can you identify a sponge it's a strange question but can you do, do you see him as someone that is still wanting to soak stuff up. Does he know there's more magic Yanofsky to come? Uh, without a doubt, you know, I, we will see, right. I, um, the, the kid is, uh, he's amazing. You know, being a sponge is, is all part of just trying to take a lot of things in. He's a man of few words most of the time. So he's, he's really absorbing everything and where he's at now with his, uh, he's asking questions now that he never asked before. So this is where I think he has the desire. So he's, yeah. he's um, this year was different. Last year, I, I started assisting him with some equipment and um, uh, he really liked it. So the more questions that he asks and uh, it's the more that I think, okay, maybe he wants to give this a try, you know? And I, I had so many things I was still working on, you know, through my, my career and um, 2018, we were still, we had done so much testing with so many different things. and uh, starting to make progress. And then you're like, it all stopped, you know? And then I started training again in, in the end of 2019 and getting ready to come back in 2020. And then, um, uh, things changed a little bit again. And then I, uh, which eventually led to me calling it a day, but I still have, uh, a lot of things there that I was trying to do. And I feel like they're those unfinished projects that, um, could still be good so i was waiting i'm just kind of waiting for waiting for somebody i really want to help luke but you can't give luke too much right now because he still needs to learn how to figure it all out before you can give him too much and I, you don't want to confuse him right and maybe what i got lined up isn't going to work and maybe it's not for everybody maybe it's just for me because i ride in a specific way but magic started asking questions you know and i think oh man this is pretty cool when people start asking those kind of questions and you hear um they're potential or, or their their ideas and what they really want to do then you you get excited you know and um uh, i've been back on the phone with uh, jeff haywood again recently and uh, because magic's asking a lot of questions so i i hope that he's going to keep going that way and i i see that luke becker's living with magic and he's become a big sponge he doesn't say much either and he's but he needs to look at stuff and he needs to say it over and over and over in his head before he actually does it and um we're all different right we all have a different way of doing things and he's uh he sees what we're doing and he gets to check it all out and he's starting to ask a lot more questions too but um we we shut him down pretty early at one stage you know because they're like 
you need to figure this out before we can go to that. And, um, but I like it when he asks the questions, it's really, it's inspiring for me as an American and, um, and seeing that I have somebody else that I can hopefully help out too. That's a big test of the word desire, isn't it? If they Absolutely. start to think, hang on, I can pick this man's brains, that yeah. tells me there's a there's more to come. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and if there's for sure there is. And um that gets me really excited, you know. Magic's a, I, I really I have a lot of respect for Magic and he's a, the most uh heartfelt dude, you know. He's he's like a brother, he's like the kid that I, you know, my oldest son in one way, because I I look at him as the, you know, bringing, you know, watching him grow up and figure it all out. But now I look at him as like it's kind of a little hero at the same time, you know. You get like you get starstruck when you see him because you're like, this kid's rad. And he's he's so mentally f- focused now. He's so physically fit, like insane. He's got amazing equipment. He's got his whole uh, mechanical situation figured out. His workshop facility, his the people that are doing this media. I mean, it's 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 a huge organization that he's got going on now. And um, we all did it in our own way. But what you know, he he's got it all figured out. And I think Smartsex is another one that's got it all figured out. And Ty. Ty's talk about desire. There's another one. Ty's on fire right now. And he's asking a lot of questions and some of the things that he's doing as well himself and things that he's got lined up, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of people that are not sitting still. And so it's going to be a really, really interesting world championship. But it's unreal to think we've got a really simple bike, single cylinder, no gears, no brakes, <laughs> yet people are still just, trying to push the envelope more and more and more which is great um interesting what you said just now as well that um people like you said with luke he kind of has to process things in his mind and stuff like that and you said earlier about your daily routine so at what point did you find what makes you tick on a race day do you know what i mean like everyone's got their thing where some people might listen to certain music or some people like to just chill out other people like to be energetic on the race day when did you find your kind of groove and then sit into it? And then are you quite superstitious about your daily routine? I would say, no, I'm not superstitious, but probably because the way I do it, uh, there is probably some superstition involved because you think if I change that, what's going to happen, right? <laughs> it's the same like karma. I don't want to say anything bad because it's probably going to bite me in the ass, right? So uh, um, probably be my biggest secret if you want to call it a secret but the thing that worked for me is my my timeliness or lack of <laughs> oh so you'd rather be late i don't like downtime scott's good at that yeah? scott's very good at being late to meetings scott is yeah no, come on i hate being really? early I hate being that. early there you go what's the opposite of being early <laughs> not being early yeah. <laughs> gregory i know you don't like being early either you no, should that's... sign in for you. <laughs> yes. What are you talking about? At the local club. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Dude, give me a taco, will you? <laughs> I'll be there soon. <laughs> I love the I love no downtime. And um one of the, the the coolest stories I have that we you may or may not have heard it before. It's involves Billy and I. And uh it was the nineteen ninety-eight world. It was, it was called the World Team Cup, but it was more of the pairs format. The final was in Voyance, and we had to race the night before. Of course, you know, had to race the night before in the UK, and you have to be at the World Championship the next day. Didn't get to practice. And um, Sven Hading, uh, Sven, who was our promoter and worked with SAS for all those years, and he um, he set up a private flight for the, the club because we were riding. That was Cradley. Were we... Crayley Stoke still then or no? Maybe we're just. I think you were at Stoke then. Yeah. No. Yeah, I think it was Stoke 98, wasn't it? No, Stoke, that was 96. It was Crayley Stoke. Um, So anyway, I think it must have been something to do. Sven organized some sort of a flight for for all of us. And he brought the whole Crayley crew or or some crew uh, on a flight to Voyens. Um. And something happened. The flight was late. We were going to fly in, do the race, and we were going to fly back out the same night. So because we had another race in England on the Sunday, I believe, something was going on. We had to get back and forth. So he had arranged a flight for us 
broth and safe or some airline that um, was an SAS affiliate. And we flew into Voyance, but there was a problem and we were had to be delayed. We were super late. So by the time we flew in there, um, I just remember that um, I could have this wrong now, but I don't think so. Anyway, we were late getting in there and it was raining, of course, but Sam or Malenko was there. He was our, it was Billy and I and Sam was our reserve uh, at that time. And Sam did the practice. So we're talking, it was down to getting to the track on time to even make the meeting for a world championship. And we fly in and I'm sitting there with Billy, like, I'm like, I'm, I'm cool with being not on time. Right. But I'm like, we're pressing the limit here. And I looked at Billy, he goes, bro, no downtime. This is awesome. (laughs) And I was like, that's right. And that is how I always was, you know, the, the longer you sit at the racetrack and the more you, you look around and you start trying to, maybe I shouldn't run that sprocket. Maybe I should change the gear. Maybe I should ride the other bike because this engine that was good here and that one was good there. And then you start thinking about, then you start looking at the program and I never looked at the program. I don't care who I'm racing. All I need to know is, do I have red, blue, yellow, white? What gate do I have? And I wouldn't look at the riders until I was at the lining up zone or at the starting line. You know, I knew who it was, but then I just looked at them as they were just numbers, you know, and it was just, you pulled up to the line, you looked over and you're like, if you're on your day, you're like, I wonder who's going to be second. Right. (laughs) And And I understand you get these riders get to a meeting like two, three hours before and, and I just think, like you said, subconsciously, your mind is already on the job. As soon as you yeah. get to that stadium, you can sit in your van, listen to whatever music you want. You can watch whatever video you want. But back there, that's still ticking away. And yeah. so, yeah, exactly. I don't want to be super late, but given a choice, I'd rather be putting my kit on in the van than sitting at a track three hours early because otherwise you're just stealing yeah, that's on the it. Truth. But- I, was, I did that my whole career. Yeah, covering the Grand Prix, it's all the little routines. I'm, I love watching the riders and their little things that they do. Um, like I said, is it a superstition? Is it a routine? Whatever. I mean, we know you always got a little goggle thing at the start. That's one of your little things. I've got things in my cutouts, and I, that's what I love about it. I love watching all those little bits that riders do just to put themselves in the zone or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's true. You do it in the all those things that I did, I, I didn't realize them until people talk about it. And you just, because you're getting up there and you're doing it and I'm adjusting my goggles because I'm just trying to get them just to sit in that, that spot. Right. And sometimes they're just a little bit off. We're talking, it's probably like a micro hair, but I feel it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, then you got to adjust that, and, you know, and one of those, and you just want to make sure that I don't want to have, I need to be loose when I get to the starting line. Right. And if there's a little tug on them on my sleeve there, I'm like, got to fix that and come on you know there's just everything's just got to be right and if sometimes that clock is at almost at zero you know and you're one last shot before you pull in there but now it's right (laughs) i have two minutes that's what that clock's for and that's what i i get angry about when they warn you for you're pushing the time limit i'm like i got two minutes that's the rule so i'm gonna use every it's no downtime right so i i might have been the last guy on the track but i got two minutes That's my time. Let me yeah. just let me have my time. <laughs> cool. Right. Real quick, before we move on to last bit, you touched on your son there. Um, see him on the social medias. He's, he's, I mean, you must be super proud of him. He's, he's very professional about what he does and he's got a strong passion for it. Clearly. Um, does he, does he want to replicate his dad or is he happy just going sideways in America right now and just loving being on the bike? He is I don't think he wants to replicate me at all. And uh, from a young age, he has always said that, but I'm not you. So he's got really strong minded and uh, I get it. No problem. And I don't want you to be me, you know? Um, So he's, um, he's definitely got a little bit of me and my wife and he's very independent and he's really focused. He's, he's definitely not uh, on the same time frame as me. He's, he's early very early for everything and everything's got to be done and everything's got to be straight. He's great at school. He does. He's a straight A student. He's a facts guy. He's got to know what he's got going on. And I'm just like, that is so not me. <laughs> so you were so, not good at school then? Uh, I did good at school because I had to. Otherwise okay. my dad wouldn't let me ride. But 
Don't ask me to repeat everything I learned. <laughs> he is like you because he is a sponge. Because I remember he, yeah. time with you guys in Sweden, and he asked so many questions about the numbers and who did what and where they did this and everything. So he's he, the he, the sponge has rubbed off. That part, the difference is I would have never asked. I would have just waited for the information to come and hoped that I would get everything because I was too afraid to ask. And uh, if I would have asked, I probably would have got a heck of a lot more information instead of trying to figure it out all those years. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I could just talk for hours because it's, uh, I mean, we haven't even really touched on your career much, but obviously the show's about what makes people tick and being a speed freak. So it's really cool. Um, We've seen you in pressure situations on the TV so many times, whether it's having to make a win in your last race to get in the final or whether it comes to the final, winning a championship. So we know you can handle the pressure. Um, but can you handle the pressure of the last lap questions that are going to be coming at you in a minute? Dude, probably not, but uh, bring it on, man. Well, there's I'm no downtime, so you're not, I'm not prepared. So. I'm not scared. No, and you asked me about this, too. I, I did. No, I said, I don't... do you want a heads up or not? And I should have known. No, because you'll either get a good answer or you're going to get nothing. Well, let's find out, shall we? <laughs> so, right, we're going straight in. It's the old classic. We keep it nice and simple. We've gone on an American theme just because it's for you. So we've gone with a classic snog, marry, avoid. And your three ladies are, as is a chat show, Oprah Winfrey. Ellen's generous, and that's an interesting one. And Ricky Lake. So who are you going to snog? Who are you going to marry? Who are you going to avoid? Um, I'm going to avoid Ricky Lake. I'm going to I'm going to snog Ellen, and so I'm going gonna... to marry Oprah. Good chap. Yeah, pretty pretty good answers there. Um, next up, are you a member of the My High Club? What's the mile high club? <laughs> well, you know, you've got your SAS bonus points, but I don't think these ones qualify for the mile high club. So, what's the mile high club? Oh, come on, Gregory. Come on, Greg. I thought it was a seven mile high club. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, moving on. We'll never know. We'll never know. Well, there's some secrets that never be told. <laughs> we'll just never know. There you go. Right. So, I've hit my head a lot of times too. So, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll give you a pass on that one right then next one so what does this well known um, yeah. what does this well known acronym not stand for so what does AMA not stand for it's hard to not come up with something instantly a motorcycle it. athlete <laughs> there you go yeah, I, I know I, I stopped myself you know it was just like he threw me off with the mile high club thing so now I'm like no it's um Another motorcycle athlete. Perfect. Very good. Very good. All right, moving on. Who was your first <laughs> celebrity crush, Hancock? Oh, Pat Benatar. Still a fan? No. Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Question, but straightforward answer. No. Okay. All right, then. Gregory, what's better, sex or winning a race? You guys are bad, man. Is there anything like, is there like the all of the above? <laughs> <laughs> I, that, dude. You're a and you can take the fifth. The, the thing, no, I, I could probably do that, but it depends who the sex was with, right? <laughs> of course. We don't need no details. It's a real symbol. <laughs> you just put sex and motorcycles on the same question there. Come on. <laughs> hey, yo, mate, it's pressure. How did you win so many world championships? See, that's my secret. I can't tell you. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, he's not going to answer that one. Um, uh, yeah, no, dude, that's no. I mean, uh, I'm going to take sex for sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it moves on to the next question really nicely. Um, socks in bed. That was socks that you wear on your feet. Yes or no? Um, only if I have a really bad cold and you cut some onions up and you put them in your socks. That's okay. a whole other show for a whole other day. Yeah, that was that was Dita. All right, then. Have you ever weed in the shower? Dude, there's a bear in the woods. Polar bear doesn't. I know. I knew you were going to come back with that one. <laughs> so we're talking about bears, not polar bears. All right. Okay. Of course I do. Yeah, yeah fair uh, enough. Sorry. Um, what are you scared of? 
not winning. There you go. It's one little secret. Right then, real simple. Text the call. Call. Cool. cool. Good stuff. Right. So then now the other bit. Now the last little bit of pressure is we've got what we call the, the dodgy dice. We've got the uh, tongue. I'm sweating twist. under my arms now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure your it's sleeves video. are ready. So we've got <laughs> the um the rude tongue twister roulette. <laughs> So we're gonna have you got uh, we're gonna have six options for you, and then we're gonna roll the dodgy dice. So we've got number one is the pheasant plucker, number two is puggy wuggy, number three is fig plucker, number four is sock cutter, number five is mother hunt, and number six is Susie sitting. So is there any of those that you're kind of feeling like you don't want to get? Um pheasant plucker okay well we're gonna and I, it was hard to say that, that <laughs> yeah so we're gonna roll the dodgy dice so they're gonna go right now and we're gonna see what you get so you don't want number one so we're gonna have to see so the dice are rolling we're gonna see what comes up so you have got number two huggy Ooh. wuggy so i'm gonna fire it over to you on your little uh instagram thing right now so it's gonna be uh it's going to be right with you. So if you check your phone, Greg, it's okay. with you. As you like, no downtime, you're not allowed to pre-read. You just got to read it out. The rule is as fast as you can, straight off the bat. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> Mrs. Puggy Wuggy has a square cut punt. Not a punt cut square, just a square cut punt. It's round in the stern and blunt in the front. Mrs. Puggy Wuggy has a square cut punt. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> See, when the, when the pressure's on, he delivers. <laughs> Very good. We're getting yeah, to yeah, the game. We got to hear all of it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, awesome. Um, you know what? Thanks a lot. It's always good to round out a little bit, but uh, it's been awesome. Thank you very much, Greg. No, thank you. This has probably been one of the most exciting and, and different, more random ones. This is really bitching, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. And great to see you too, Rando. So, man. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, thanks for joining us. And thanks to you guys for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to our sponsors, ATPI Travel. Check us all out on the social medias. We may even have the, what was the drink again? The so What was your Monster. famous? Spodiote. Spodiote. We may even put the Spodiote on there for you. So until next time, see you soon. ATPI. Delivering what really matters.